Up next, Margaret Mantarella and Joachim Rocha, principal software engineers from Microsoft, talking about an easy way to use eBPF tools in their cluster through a web UI that lowers the learning curve and improves user experience. Welcome to this presentation about how to bring the power of eBPF tools to your Kubernetes web UI. I'm Marga. I am a software engineering manager at Microsoft following the acquisition of Kim Falk back in May. And my name is Joaquin. I'm also an engineering manager at Microsoft. And uh, in our talk, we will, in, yes, we will <laughs> look into Inspector Gadget, uh, what it is and uh, how it integrates eBPF with Kubernetes with a nice demo. And then we'll follow up with uh, with uh, an overview of this web UI we created and how we can integrate or offer you more functionality uh, on your cluster by integrating Inspector Gadget with a demo that will surely go well. So back to you, Margaret. Thanks, Chucky. All right. So part of what we are going to discuss today is Inspector Gadget. And Inspector Gadget is a tool that makes it possible for us to use eBPF tools in the Kubernetes context. eBPF tools are super cool. And there's more and more tools uh, every day, almost, that we can use to get insights as to what's going on with our applications, inspect syscalls, open files, network connections, and a lot more. But uh, using them in Kubernetes is not always straightforward. And that's why we created Inspector Gadget, which is a tool that makes it super easy for us to use eBPF tools in a cloud native environment. So today, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of what Inspector Gadget does and how it works. There are more talks and uh, a lot of details that you can find out if you go to our GitHub repo and you look through the readme. And so if you want to know more about how it works or see more demos about other gadgets that we won't show today, that's where you can find them. Now, what does it mean when I say that Inspector Gadget makes it easy to use eBPF tools in a cloud native environment. When we work with Kubernetes, we want to debug at the pod level. And using process IDs is kind of clunky. If, if we are doing it manually, it can get quite annoying. So we need something that translates between pods and containers and the process IDs so that we can attach the eBPF programs to that. And the eBPF programs that exist out there, many of them are at the PID level. So that's where we need to do this translation. And we also want to filter with the selectors that we normally use to refer, refer to Kubernetes objects. So for example, if we want to trace all the pods that have a given label or that are in a given namespace, we don't want to be looking up each of the PIDs. We want to just have the tooling do that for us. We also want the user experience to be similar to that of the other tools that the users are using. So if they are using the command line with kubectl, we want them to use a similar command line that matches the kubectl command line. And if they are using a web UI, we want them to use an integrated experience with their web UI. So how does Inspector Gadget work? It has two pieces. Uh, first, there's the kubectl plugin. So when you are using it from the command line, you have this plugin that communicates with the Kubernetes API and sends requests. And then the most important piece is a gadget pod that runs on each of the nodes in the cluster. So there's a daemon set that controls these pods. and these pods are the ones that are in charge of injecting the eBPF code in the node when we want to run a trace. And what kind of traces can we run? So we have a bunch of different gadgets available. And with each release, we are putting out more and more gadgets. Um, the ones in blue in this slide are the ones that are wrappers around the VCC tools. So we make it super easy to use VCC tools in the cloud native context. And it's really easy to add more. So 
whenever a user asks for another of these BCC tools, we can just add it very quickly. And then we also have our own gadgets that we developed for solving specific uh, use cases that we thought were interesting. And so how do we tell these tools uh, what pods to trace? We have uh, different ways of selecting which containers we want to trace. Uh, this slide here shows like all of the possible ways we can select by the label, the namespaces, the pod names, the nodes, the container names, but of course we don't need to select by all of them at the same time. You can select just one of them and then you will get the output corresponding to whatever you selected. But as I mentioned, that is like the common line and we want to also integrate with web UIs. This is what this talk is about, is about web UIs. For integrating with web UIs, we have introduced this new custom resource called trace. So using this CRD, we can specify the kind of traces that we want to run without having to use the command line. So if we are using a web UI, the web UI can send, can create this CRD so that the gadget pod sees it and creates the trace and does the work without the user having to execute any commands from the command line. When we are creating trace, we are going to specify which gadget we want to use. That's in the, in the spec gadget. We specify which gadget we want the, to run the trace. We also specify how we are going to filter. For example, in, in this example, we are filtering by namespace and by component um, and by label, sorry. And we can also specify other things like where the output is going to be and how the trace is going to run. And I know all of this may sound complicated, but it's actually pretty straightforward. And the best way to see that is to do some demos. So let's move to the demo. All right, so I'm here, I have a, have a mini cube cluster. And the first thing I'll do is run a bio latency trace. To do that, I have already created this trace here that says that the gadget, the gadget is bio latency and I don't want to filter for anything. I just want to run bio latency in the whole node uh, bio latency, what it does is it creates a histogram of the block IO latency. Uh, well, you will see the histogram, but of what we select in this case, this node. So what I'm going to do, okay. What I'm going to do is apply this trace in the cluster. So now the trace is created, we can list it, it's there, but it's, it hasn't yet started because we said that it was, the mode was manual. And that means that we need to annotate it with a start operation so that it actually starts running. So to do that, I'm going to annotate it with start. So there it is. I annotate the trace with start. So now the, the gadget pod has injected the EBPF code and it's running bio latency. And when I want it to stop, I just change the annotation to stop. And so now what happens? Well, the resource in the status, because we said the output mode is status, in the status of the resource, we have the output of the command. So to look at that, I'll do a kubectl describe. Uh, and then this thing. And let's do it with less because it's long. So over here, we can see the histogram and we see how many operations took how many microseconds and we see that between 128 and 255 microseconds, it's the most operations. And then around that number, 
uh, there are the a distribution of how long the operations took. And there was one operation that took a really long time. All right, so that's one possible gadget. And uh, I'll show another one to just to show a little bit of variety of how the gadgets work. And this time I'm going to show the second gadget. So this one, I have it in the UWSGI trace. And in this case, uh, I have here, so I'm tracing the second gadget and I'm filtering for one specific pod. So I want to, what the second gadget does is it uh, looks at the syscalls that a pod or, or more than one are executing and then generates the second policy associated with those syscalls. So in this case, what I'm going to do is, uh, well, first install the trace. So let's clean the screen. All right, so I have installed the trace and I also have a service running with that pod. And I, I want to measure which syscalls are executed when I query this service but before I need to start the trace. So let's start it. But instead of by a latency trace here, it has to say second, that was the name of our trace. Okay, so now it's started. Now I can curl this URL. Okay. And now I will annotate it again, but instead of stop, because how this uh, gadget works, I will call generate. And this will generate the second policy associated with the syscalls that this used. Now, again, I will call the describe. And here I will put second. And here they are. So these are the syscalls that uh, that one request caused. So the the pod made a bunch of like uh, networking syscalls of accepting the connection and uh, replying to it and so on. And we can see that here. All right, that was a quick demo. There are a lot more in the website, as I mentioned before, but now let's go back to the presentation. And Joaquim, you're up. Thank you, Margaret. That was pretty cool. Um, yeah, like we said, um, like like you said, uh, you know, the, the way that you can change the, the, the functionality and uh, what can be done with suspect the gadget through those annotations brings a lot of possibilities. And we're going to see them uh, in this um, in this part of the presentation. So for that, I'm introducing a headlamp. Let me just share my screen this time. All right, so let's look at headlamp now. And um, yeah, first, if you're familiar with web UIs for Kubernetes, you may be wondering why did we create a new one? And uh, what, since we have many out there, the reason was that at the time we were doing a web UI for a, a Kubernetes flavor of ours. And uh, we thought, okay, let's just change a few things in a, in, a, in a project, in a web UI, or maybe create some plugins, but we weren't really satisfied with, the, with how much we could extend in those. And we didn't really want to just uh, for can create a completely different project. So uh, so that's why we created Headlamp. So what it offers you is a vendor independent and generic web UI. So, you know, there's nothing in, in here that you need to run uh, in the cluster for this to work, uh, unless you want to host it in the cluster, that is. Um, it uses very familiar uh, technologies uh, if you want to hack on it. Uh, and very importantly, it's extensible using uh, what we call front-end plugins. And we'll, we'll look into that. 
Um, you can, again, run it in cluster or on your desktop. So in that case, uh, the cluster will know nothing about the, the web UI again. And we have versions for Linux, uh, Mac, and Windows. Uh, another particularity that I think uh, is different, uh, at least in this uh, web UI, is that the, in what comes to, to the permissions that you, that you have, uh, those uh, reflect uh, our back uh, uh, from the cluster in this case, uh, and that is reflected in the UI. So if you do not have uh, permissions to delete uh, a pod, for example, uh, then you will not have a delete button in the UI. Uh, the same for you know, editing a pod and, and all that. So, Let's, and of course, it's 100% open source. You can check the, the repo up there. Uh, so very quickly, what, uh, you know, what does it look like in terms of a very rough diagram? Uh, so we have the, the cluster running up there. Um, you can have several clusters because it, it supports multiple clusters. And um, yeah, and the, the, you know, the, the case here is for when you're running it from your desktop machine. Um, so in this case, headlamp, uh, like I said, has a backend and a frontend. They talk to each other, of course. And um, I said we have plugins, and they are frontend plugins. So why are they pointing at the backend? The reason is that even though they are uh, dynamically loaded by the frontend, it's the backend that uh, basically determines uh, what what the plugins are. And the reason why this is done is is because if you want to host headlamp in your cluster and uh, you probably don't want your users to be just using whatever plugins they find out there from other uh, you know vendors or or whatever they found on the internet so in this case it's the backend that says okay i have all these plugins feel free to load them if you're running it from the desktop of course you can uh, feel free to uh, you know uh, uh, add a plugin or remove a plugin and all that is reflected uh, directly in the ui so what exactly are front-end plugins in, in this case? Um, so they're you know, files that are JavaScript bundles. Um, they're set up from the backend, like I said, uh, and uh, they get loaded from the front-end. And I won't go into too much detail on the development of these. Uh, that's not what this talk is about. If you want to check uh, you know, uh, the capability and how to set up a plugin or how to start a plugin, uh, which I advise you to uh, check out this blog post uh, that has also a nice video in it. So just to quickly tell you, so how can I run? I just want to quickly check headlamp, uh, maybe change a thing or two. How do I run it? What do I need to run in the cluster? Again, um, really nothing. You just have to clone the project, make, make run backend and run front end, and you should be uh, up and running. So I have a live demo that will go completely nice here. So let me stop sharing and let me start sharing browser. So let's go into headlamp. This is the first screen you see. Uh, like I said, it's multiple, uh, it supports multiple clusters and that's why I, I have two clusters configured. Uh, Minikube is running locally, of course, and then we have another cluster elsewhere, not locally. Uh, yeah, so as you can see, this is a, just to, to give you a quick overview, this is a pretty vanilla or I would say generic UI for a, for a Kubernetes web UI. You have the side uh, bar, you have your events, uh, some metrics from uh, from the cluster, you can, you know, you can list nodes uh, with statistics. Uh, you can go, let's say, let's look at the, at the pods. So you can, for example, search for uh, something here, gadget. You can uh, go and do like, uh, okay, namespaces. Let's select a, a few. And uh, this gets persistent across the views if you select it. Um, so, so far it's, it's pretty, uh, you know, what you would expect. You can, again, create uh, something. Um, you can check the, the documentation in there for whatever you're doing. And uh, yeah. Now let's talk about the plugins. So what you see here uh, already has some plugins running. You could have figured that out because we have something very um, specific in here uh, for the occasion of this uh, event. I thought it's nice to check the event page uh, when you're giving a talk. So 
let's uh, I, I spent about one minute doing this uh, quick link to the events page but the idea is that you know let's let's imagine that you're you're hosting your you're hosting headlamp for your operators and you want to have something that checks the status of, of an application or something and you want to put this up here uh, for everybody to see you can do that uh, another thing that uh, is running and uh, looks very you know very um, integrated is in here so if you can see some of these buttons are vanilla so that they come with uh they, they come with headlamp itself but this one here is actually showing you something that comes from inspector gadget so inspector gadget has this um gadget called uh, trace loops and that's like a, a nest trace that is running uh and you can see all those uh, syscalls from pods so this is useful if you want to debug uh, an application, for example. So let's see what what's going on. So you can see, you know, some of the calls here. But of course, of course, this pod is running. So what happens if it dies, right? So that's why this plugin also offers a different view, essentially the same that you saw, but also for pods that have died, and that's uh, this area here. Uh, so if we go here and we click on another. You know, you still have the same functionality, right? Even if it died, uh, you can download these logs for, you know, offline inspection. I don't know. And uh, yeah, so this is one example. Now, as you saw, Margaret showed you the uh, bio latency, uh, the bio latency gadget. And uh, now I changed to Mini Cube to show you pretty much the same. So in Mini Cube, as you see, these are different, uh, slightly different. And that's because um, I chose not to install the metric server on this one. Uh, just to give an example of how the UI, uh, the UI kind of adapts if you feel like in something, right? So trying to do more or less what uh, Marga did, you can go to a node again. And let's say that you want, you know, checking the block IO latency is something that you want to do. And it's already integrated here. So you just have to navigate to a node. And this is uh, coming from a plugin called the bio latency plugin because we're original. And uh, you uh, you know, you have the, the latest results and uh, or you can start getting the data again. So let's say that something is going on with an application. You suspect it has to do with the with the latency in this case. So you can start measuring it. And it starts, you know, tells you that it's run. So why is this, um, why is uh, what, what Marga talked about uh, with the annotations and such, why is that so powerful? Is because, um, you know, none of, of that work uh, has to be delegated to the, to the client. So in this case, in, to the plugin. Uh, so basically uh, there's no state uh, or no advanced state that the plugin has to manage. And this allows us to go to different views to even reload, uh, you know, the page and, uh, whatever we want and then when we or change computers right and when we go back to the node it says oh it's been running for like 45 seconds or two days or whatever right and then again you can press stop and see what happened uh, so you can quickly access it uh, so again that you know the way that inspector gadget is um, is allowing the uh, you know clients to control uh, its capability from the outside without having to manage the, the the state ourselves. That's very good because it saves me a lot of, of work, of course, uh, and also because it opens the possibility of applications as uh, as headlamp and others uh, to integrate it uh, more easily. So and that's uh, that's it for the demo. Uh, I think that me stop it and go back to the slides. All right, thank you, Joaquim. That was really cool. Uh, so what about the future? What's in store uh, for Headlamp in the next few months? Yeah, so uh, increasing the plugin library functionality or the, or the functionality that the Plugin library covers is always uh, is always uh, in our in our goals. So uh, we recently added that section um, that um, 
section capability of or the capability of changing the sections in a in a resource um, we want to do more also in terms of branding so you can have something that looks completely different uh, in the in the ui um, yeah and um, basically gathering users and uh, making sure that other people can write plugins and that we have a, a nice ecosystem of plugins that's that's what we're aiming for what about uh, nice. what about inspector gadget well, so uh, we've been working really hard on adding this uh, new CRD and, and adapting all our plugins uh, or our gadgets to the new model. And we want to make it easy to integrate with more and more tools because we think that's how uh, users will get to use it. So add more CRD functionality, add more output modes, add more run modes, and yeah, make it super easy to integrate it with as many tools as possible. Great. And uh, how can one contribute to uh, Inspector Gadget? Uh, right. So uh, we have a contributing document that uh, explains what you need to do to compile, to uh, set up your first uh, cluster to experiment and how all the little details that you need to know. We are very happy to receive contributions from anybody out there that uh, cares about this. And even if you just have like use cases that you would want us to consider, that's also useful. So feel free to just file issues of things that uh, you feel we should take into account. And we also have a Slack channel in the Kubernetes Slack. So feel free to join that and tell us what you think about Spectre Gadget? And I guess it's the same for Headlamp. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly the same, different channels, different URLs. But yeah, check it out if you want to contribute. Uh, you are very welcome uh, in the community. And uh, yeah, talk to us. Thank you very much. Thanks to Microsoft Azure and Equinix Metal for supporting us at the champion level. We also want to thank Red Hat and Slim.ai for funding us at our supporter level.